Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology, and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International A Level, Biology Unit 1 for October 2021. This is the part 2 video. I'll put the link to the part 1 video below the description box. Let us begin with the first question. Question 5. Genetic screening can be used to test for aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is the presence of an abnormal number of chromosomes in a cell. Aneuploidy can affect the miscarriage rate of implanted embryos. Following screening, only embryos with a correct number of chromosomes are implanted into the female. The table shows the miscarriage rate of two groups of implanted embryos. One group embryos not screened for aneuploidy, the other are embryos screened and shown not to have aneuploidy. The results are presented in the table. Here we have the age range of women at implantation. We also have the miscarriage rate in percentage. This is the data for implanted embryos not screened for aneuploidy, and that is the data for implanted embryos screened and shown not to have aneuploidy. The first question asks, explain how this data shows that there is a correlation between the age of the women and the miscarriage rate. From the data, we can see that the rate of miscarriages increase as age increases, whether they were screened for aneuploidy or if they were not screened for aneuploidy, However, we can conclude that this is a correlation and not a causation. So I say it because the rate of miscarriage increases with increase in age for both screened and unscreened embryos. There is a correlation, but the data does not show a causation. Moving on. Here they say, explain the conclusions that can be drawn from this data about causes of a miscarriage. Here we can see that as age increases, the percentage of miscarriages increases more among the embryos that were not screened for aneuploidy in comparison to those that were screened for aneuploidy. However, we know that there are other factors that were not considered by this data that could also lead to a miscarriage. So in our answer, we have to include that as well. So I said, aneuploidy results in miscarriage because if the embryos are screened, it results in fewer percentages of miscarriages. Other factors like age, mutations, the process of implantation, diet could affect the miscarriage since screened embryos can miscarry as well. Since screened embryos can miscarry as well. So my second point here was to show you that if we look at the data, there is miscarriage still happening among screened embryos and this shows us that aneuploidy is not the sole cause of miscarriages. There are other factors that were not considered in these results and those could be responsible for causing the miscarriages. The next question says explain why conclusions made using this data may not be valid. Of course, from the table, they did not give us any indication of the sample size that was used in the experiment. They did not pull error bars or standard deviations, so we cannot conclude if the experiments were repeated, and so the validity of the data cannot be established. And because we were not sure if the unscreened embryos had aneuploidy, we cannot be able to conclude on that as well. And also their lifestyle factors like diet, other diseases, exercise, smoking, and so on that could be responsible for causing miscarriages. Moving on, here they say discuss the implications of screening embryos for aneuploidy before implantation. So here we have to talk about effects of pre-implantation screening. So I said pre-implantation screened embryos still get miscarried, so the screening process gives people false hope. It means that people will pay for the screening of the embryos and once they're implanted and thought to not contain the condition, they end up miscarrying as well. False positives of aneuploidy could lead to unnecessary wastage of embryos and other genetic defects may be found further discouraging the people. And to some people, discarding embryos is unethical. So this brings us to the end of question 5. Let's continue to question 6. Question 6. Acute hepatic porphyria, AHP, is a very rare genetic disorder. A drug has been developed to treat AHP. This drug was tested in a clinical trial involving 94 patients from 18 countries. The drug was given to 48 of the patients, and the other 46 patients were a control group. Comment on the design of this clinical trial. So looking at the information given to us, we can see that only 94 patients were used in total, and therefore the size of the patients was quite small. So here I said the sample size used is very small. And since this was carried out in 18 countries, that means that a lot of different varieties of people were not included. 
However, in the question, we were told that AHP is a very rare genetic disorder, and that means there could be fewer people available globally with this genetic condition. So I can say that because AHP is a very rare disorder, not so many patients are available to participate in this study, and that can validate why they use only 94 patients in this study. The next part says, each patient was given 2.5 milligrams of the drug per kilogram of body mass once a month. The drug is available as a solution with a concentration of 189 milligram per centimeter cubed. They want us to calculate the volume of drug that was given each month to a patient with a body mass of 64 kilograms. So here I began by looking at the concentration. We can see 2.5 milligrams of the drug per kilogram of body mass. That means a 64 kilogram person will receive 64 times 2.5, which is equal to 160 milligrams. However, from the question, they say the drug is available as a solution with a concentration that. So we have to find a way of converting this into the required concentration. So if a concentration of 189 milligrams is found in one centimeter cubed, we can say that 189 milligrams is contained in one centimeter cubed, and therefore one milligram is going to be contained in one over 189 centimeters cubed. Therefore, this required concentration should be contained in 1 over 189 times the 160, giving us 0 0.847 centimeters cubed. And if you round it off, you could say 0 0.8. However, I left it in three significant figures, which is 0 0.847 centimeters cubed. Moving on. Here they say, no zero was experienced by 27% of the patients receiving this drug. Calculate the number of patients who experienced no zero. Remember the number of people who received the drugs were 48. So 27% 27 is 27 over 100 times 48, which gives us 12.96. However, people are in whole numbers, so round this off to the nearest whole number, and that gave me 13. So we can say 13 patients experienced no zero. Part B, this drug is a double-stranded RNA molecule. The diagram shows part of the base sequence on one of the RNA strands. They want us to complete the diagram to show the base sequence on the other RNA strand. The key thing here is knowing that in RNA we do not have thymine, but we have uracil. Also know that cytosine pairs with guanine, and adenine will pair with uracil on the other side, so that is going to be G. Here we have uracil, cytosine, uracil, 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 and cytosine here. Describe the bonding in this double-stranded RNA molecule. If this is a double-stranded RNA molecule, there should be hydrogen bonds between complementary bases between the two strands. There should also be phosphodiester bonds as well as covalent bonds. So I said, in this RNA molecule, there are phosphodiester bonds which are formed between adjacent mononucleotides in each strand. I'm talking about those formed between the ribose of one mononucleotide and the phosphate of another mononucleotide. We also have covalent bonds that attach a ribose sugar and the base. And we also have hydrogen bonds that exist between complementary bases between the two strands. In AHP, toxic porphyrin molecules build up. The synthesis of the heme component of hemoglobin involves several steps. Each step in the synthesis of heme is catalyzed by a different enzyme. This drug works by interfering with the messenger RNA copies from the gene coding for one of these enzymes. Explain how the action of this drug helps patients with AHP. Because the questions say the drug interferes with messenger RNA copies to prevent translation as well as changing the messenger RNA molecule as a whole, so I said, there will be less translation of messenger RNA into the intended protein, which is basically the enzyme. Or the altered messenger RNA could affect the shape of the protein, which is supposed to be the enzyme produced, and thus cannot function as an enzyme in the production of the heme. And there will be less toxic buffering produced. So this brings us to the end of question 6. Let's continue to question 7. Question 7. A number of factors affect the risk of a person developing heart disease. One factor affecting this risk is the level of high-density lipoprotein, HDL, in the blood. The graph shows the effects of HDL levels and low-density lipoproteins, LDL levels, in the blood on the risk of men developing heart disease. 
So we can see that these are men being sampled and on the vertical axis, we have risk of heart disease in men. On the horizontal axis, we have LDL level in the blood and we have various curves representing the concentration of high density lipoproteins from the highest here to the lowest here. Overall, when I look at this graph, I can see that as the concentration of LDL increases in blood, there is an increase in risk of heart disease among men at all concentrations of high density lipoprotein, whether the lowest concentration of HDL or the highest concentration of HDL. So let's continue to the questions. Here they say, for men, a blood HDL level greater than 40 mg per decimeter cubed is thought to be optimum. Explain why a man with a blood HDL level greater than 40 mg per decimeter cubed may still have a high risk of developing heart disease. They want us to use the information in the graph and your own knowledge to support your answer. Now, when I take you back here to the graph, we already saw that the higher the concentration of LDL, the higher the risk of heart disease among men for all concentrations of HDL. We also know that the ratio of LDL to HDL is important in minimizing the risk of heart disease. So here I said, as the concentration of HDL increases, the risk decreases. I'm talking about the risk of heart disease decreases as based on the graph. This is because HDL is involved in the removal of LDL from the blood by the liver. It also enhances uptake of cholesterol by the liver. From the graph, we also see that the higher the concentration of LDL, the higher the risk of heart disease. And this is because LDL can form plaques within blood vessels. I went on to say that the ratio of HDL to LDL affects the risk. The higher the HDL to LDL ratio, the lower the risk of heart disease. My next point was the higher the concentration of cholesterol in the blood, the more cholesterol can build up to form atheromas, and this leads to increase in the blood pressure and a higher chance of damaging the endothelial cells. This can trigger inflammatory responses. If it occurs in the coronary artery, the heart can be starved of oxygen and nutrients, so aerobic respiration will not occur and a heart attack could result. My final point is talking about the other possible causes of heart disease. So I said the risk of developing heart disease could still be high due to genetic conditions. It could be due to high salt intake. The man may also be a smoker and smoking leads to formation of atheromas. If he is older, then there is an age-related component to the heart disease he could also be obese. Moving on. Here they say very high levels of cholesterol in the blood can alter the structure of HDL. This altered HDL is less effective in reducing the risk of heart disease. The diagram shows the structure of HDL in blood with a low level of cholesterol and altered HDL in blood with high levels of cholesterol. The question here says compare and contrast the structure of HDL with altered HDL. If we look at these two structures, we see both have APOA. So I said both contain the APOA and both contain the phospholipid layer. We can see they both have the phospholipid layer, that one here and this one here. Looking at the differences, we can see that altered HDL is larger while this one is smaller. Altered HDL has more CE. These ones here, they are more in the altered one. And altered HDL has fewer long chain polyunsaturated PCs in comparison to the non-altered one. I'm talking about these ones here, you can see there are fewer, yet here we have more. And in the other side, we see this one has more CEs, while the other has fewer. Continuing on, here they say the antioxidant properties of altered HDL are reduced. Explain the effect that this has on reducing the risk of heart disease. We know that antioxidants are good at removing free radicals that could cause oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress, if it occurs in the blood vessels, then it could lead to plaque or atheroma formation. So here I said, there will be less reduction in the number of free radicals, and this leads to more damage to the cells lining the blood vessels, which is oxidative stress. Therefore, plaque and atheroma formation will not be reduced. So this brings us to the end of question seven. Let's continue to question eight. Question eight, these chickens have a mixture of black and white feathers. The color of the feathers of the chicken is an example of co-dominance. One parent of this speckled chicken had white feathers and the other parent had black feathers. They want us to describe the difference between each of the following pairs of terms using feather color to illustrate your answer. 
The first one is Jin and allele. Jin, this is a sequence of DNA bases coding for a particular protein. In this example, it is the gene coding for feather color. Allele, these are different versions or forms of the same gene. And here we can see the allele for black and the other for white feathers. Moving on. The next is genotype and phenotype. Genotype is a combination of different alleles, like the one for black feathers and the one for white feathers, while phenotype is the expressed characteristic trait. An example of phenotype is the color of the feathers observed while the genotype is the presence of the white or black alleles within the DNA. The next question says a black chicken was mated with a speckled chicken. They had 25 chicks. Determine the expected number of speckled chicks. You must use a genetic diagram. I took this to be the genotype for the black and this is the genotype for the speckled. So the possible gametes are going to be BB from that one here and BW from that one here. My genetic diagram gives me offsprings that are capital B, capital B for black as well as capital B, capital W, which is for speckled. So the probability of speckled chicks is going to be a half, and the number of speckled chicks is going to be 1 over 2 times 25, which gives me 12.5, and I can round that off to be 13 chicks. Moving on, in an experiment, several pairs of speckled chickens were mated together. They produced 480 chicks. The table shows the expected number of speckled chicks, white chicks, and black chicks. It also shows the actual number of each type of chicks. So here we can see there is the observed. We have that, that, and that. The expected is that, that, and that. And then they wanted us to find observed minus expected, which is that minus that giving us three, that minus that giving us five, and that minus that giving us negative eight. Now the next part was for us to get the difference between the observed minus the expected square divided by the expected. That squared gives us a 9 divided by expected 240. We got 0.0375. And here we have the squared gives us 25 divided by that, which gave us that. The squared gives us 64 divided by that, which gave us that. So that was the requirement for the table. Then they said this table can be used in a statistics test. Name the statistics test being used to analyze this data. This is called a chi squared test. To answer this question, I have already explained how I gathered results in the table, so you can refer to that as well. And then here they say calculate that. This is quite easy, just get this value plus that value and that value, because this stands for summation sign, and I got 0 0.7791 as my final answer, so the answer should be that. Moving on, finally they say explain how a critical value table could be used to accept or reject a null hypothesis for this experiment. All you need to do is you need to calculate the degree of freedom and use the critical values at p is equal to 0 0.05. Then compare the calculated value and the critical value. If the calculated value is greater than the critical value, then you can reject the null hypothesis. This is how you calculate the degree of freedom. Numbers in A minus 1 plus numbers in B minus 1. And then you would get the degree of freedom. These questions are rare in ASBio, but they are common in Unit 6 A-Level Biology. If you can refer to that, this will be made clear for you. So this brings us to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.